Over the last 80 years, there have been moments that have changed our nation. You know, those I remember where I was moments. For some of you, uh, it may have been Kennedy's assassination. You can remember exactly where you were uh, when you heard the news. For my generation, it was when it was announced that the space shuttle had exploded. Uh, others of you might remember the white Bronco being chased down the LA highways. Uh, many of us in this room remember exactly where we were when we uh, heard about the airplane flying into the World Trade uh, Center in, on 9-11. Almost everybody in this room would probably remember where you were at when you got news that, that COVID had kind of closed the world down. Uh, these events, these moments changed the history of our country. They made us a different place. We have moments in our personal lives that do just that. Maybe it's a graduation, or maybe it is a wedding, or a birth of a child, or a first day at your first job, or, or your first trip to Rupp Arena, you know, those big moments in your life, or harder, a bad doctor's report when you got the news that it was cancer, or the day that you laid a loved one in the ground. We've all had those moments that deeply affected us, and they changed us. They changed the way that we made decisions. They influenced our behavior. They even changed our outlook on life. For Christians, we all have a moment that has changed us. If you're a believer in Jesus Christ, the day that you received him as Lord and Savior, that was a life-changing moment. I was only 12 years old when I gave my life to Jesus. But the funny thing is, in that moment, I knew it was a big deal. I knew it was huge. Now, I didn't know how big a deal it was going to be. I couldn't have imagined how much that event would change me. But that day has affected the way that I view the world. It's changed the way I treat people. I have a goal of how I should treat people that's affected by that day. It is determined throughout my life what I've allowed myself to do and some things that I've abstained from. It, it shaped the way that I see myself. I am forever changed because of my faith in Christ. Well, guys, that's what authentic faith in Christ does when it intersects with the human heart. It changes you. It radically changes you. And this is the theme of the book of James. When a person has authentic faith, that faith makes a difference in your life. Now we're going to start a verse-by-verse -verse exposition of James. And as we study, especially in the weeks to come, we're going to see how this authentic faith changes every aspect of our life. But we get an immediate illustration of this life change in James 1, verse 1, when the book starts, James. Now you might say, boy, that doesn't seem earth-shattering uh, in its change, but there's a whole lot in a name, especially in this person's name. You see, James was the half-brother of Jesus. I say half-brother because uh, James uh, was a child of Mary like Jesus was, but Jesus' his father was God, and Mary had other children with Joseph, and J James was one of those children. Now, historians and the context of the book tell us that this is uh, James, Jesus' brother, who wrote this, and that's kind of a big deal because during Jesus' earthly ministry, James said, uh, not for me. He didn't believe in Jesus uh, while he walked on the earth. Uh, James, along with all of his brothers, just said, hey, th this, is not, this is not for us. We don't believe in him. Could have been jealousy. Might have been skepticism. And boy, I get that. I mean, you know, this is a kid who snored in the bed next to him. You know, uh, the one who smelled weird, just like all the other boys. He, he had to be thinking, how could this be the son of God? And... and he was so kind of put off by Jesus' public ministry. When Jesus grew in popularity, the Bible says that his family were kind of following him, trying to squelch this movement. They were telling people, hey, he's out of his mind. Don't listen to him. He, he's not worthy of following. In fact, this animosity uh, toward Jesus is so strong. When Jesus is dying on the cross, do you remember what Jesus does to his mother? He tells John, one of the disciples, hey, take care of her. 
Woman, behold your son. Because he knew that his, his brothers weren't stand-up guys. But boy, resurrections have a way of changing things, don't they? And uh, the Bible says that Jesus uh, uh, raises from the dead. In fact, this is our message. Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, I want to deliver to you that which was delivered me, which was of first importance, that Jesus died on the cross for our sins, according to the scriptures. He was buried. He rose from the dead on the third day, according to the scriptures. And he appeared to a lot of people. In particular, he appeared to the apostles. But then there's just this little side note that you might miss. And it says, and he appeared to James and then to all of the apostles. Uh, James, uh, through this resurrection appearance, becomes a committed follower of the Lord Jesus Christ. And by the way, James's conversion is just another argument of why we believe the resurrection is real. Think about it. How many of you in here have older brothers? Any of y'all have older brothers? Raise your hand. Older brothers? All right, what if they came to you and said, hey, I'm God? You're not going to believe that. You might think Satan maybe, but not God. You know, it just, James had every reason not to believe in Jesus, but the resurrection changed his mind. After his conversion, he quickly ascends in leadership in the Jerusalem church. And maybe it was because of this relationship to Jesus, or maybe it was just his unique gifting but either way he is respected in the early church and as he writes this letter he doesn't say a word that's odd he doesn't say James the brother of Jesus he doesn't say James witness of the resurrected Lord he doesn't say James the apostle he just says James. Paul, when he writes his letters, Paul, an apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ. John, when he writes his three books, John the elder to the church of Jesus. But James just stands up and says, I'm James. He doesn't leverage it at all. In fact, he just says, I'm just a servant of God. Uh, and the word here is slave. I'm a slave of God. When James applies this term to himself, he's saying, I'm God's property. God can call the shot in my life. God has every right to tell me what to do. And notice he says he's not just a servant of God, but he's a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. He doesn't clarify this because he thinks Jesus is different from God Rather, he wants to make sure that you know what he believes, that Jesus is God, that he is the one who, 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 who is God in flesh appearing. In James's day, as in ours, almost everybody believes in the concept of God. Oh, there's some people who are atheistic, but surprisingly, even with the decline of Christianity in the United States, the rise in atheism hasn't been uh, equal. The rise of agnosticism, where we're not sure which is or what is, has grown, but, but atheism has not, because most people are pretty comfortable with the concept of a God. In James's day, lots of people were comfortable with the concept of many gods. But he wants to make sure that everybody knows his God is Jesus Christ. His God is the one who died on the cross for his sins, who rose from the dead. And he was a, a, not just a follower of Jesus Christ. He says, I am a slave, a servant of Jesus Christ. He is my Lord and my life is in his hands. He addresses this letter to the 12 tribes. Uh, this is obviously referring to the people of Israel, but it, he doesn't have an exclusively Jewish audience in mind. Because the church saw themselves as a continuation of God's plan. And just as Israel were the people of God in the Old Testament, the church was also the people of God through Jesus Christ. And this church was dispersed. Uh, this is describing a time, I believe, of persecution. Probably in Acts 7 and 8 when Stephen is stoned and persecution comes on the church. But the, these Jewish Christians in Jerusalem and in the land of Palestine were being forced out by the religious leaders. And they were facing hardship because they were foreigners living in a strange land. Uh, your Bible might say that they were scattered. The word here is, is very appropriately translated scattered. It's a word that's also used for somebody taking a seed pouch that would be on their side. Grab a handful out of that seed pouch 
take that handful and just scatter them. That's what James is saying happened to many Christians. They were scattered. What's interesting to me is James did not say that they were scattered by human hands. We're going to read James and we're going to see that he believes that this scattering was the working of God. You see, James had a worldview that believed that the events of life are purposeful and not random. He believed that God had sent believers out and had, had scattered them as representatives going into the world, telling the good news of Jesus. So wherever they were and whatever they were going through, they were to display the change that Jesus had made in their life. Now, my guess is this scattering isn't what they envisioned following the Lord would be. The reality is Sometimes God does things and allows things in your life that you would never sign up for. A health issue, a job relocation, an unexpected bill, a school change. James believed that even in the scattering, God's hand is involved. But how are believers supposed to respond to this? How are we supposed to respond to as God slaves? He just scattered us us where uh, he wills. How do we respond when God works in a way that we would never sign up for? James gives three imperatives in the next few verses that help us navigate these difficult, difficult times. The first one is found in James 1 verse 2. There's an imperative there that says, this is what you need to do. You need to consider it great joy when you experience various trials. I don't know about you, but joy is not my go-to experience when something hard comes into my life. You know, I, typically I feel anger, especially if I feel slighted. Why was that person able to get away with it? Why did I get caught? Why did I get pulled over? Three people just passed me. Why is this? I don't understand. Or I feel despair. Are things ever going to change in my life? Will the pain ever go away? Will the relationship ever heal? Maybe you're asking today, when will my big break come? Will this round of fertility treatments work? Will I ever find somebody? Notice he didn't say feel pure joy. Nobody's happy when they have a flat tire. I mean, that's phony. If a Christian has a flat tire and says, oh, praise Jesus, I had a flat tire, they're lying. (laughs) They're they're, they're just phony. That's not real. I mean, nobody, nobody is excited when their luggage is late or their team loses or they get a bad doctor's report or their job is gone or their relationship is strained. Nobody's having fun when their kids are rebelling or their finances are tight. You don't feel joy. You consider it joy. You might not feel overjoyed with the moment, but you can be thankful that you know that God has a plan in every season. You see, hardships, they come in lots of flavors. Some of them are incredibly intense. Some of them not as much. Uh, We have various trials, but in whatever variety they come, we need to remind ourselves that God is working in me. Some read these verses and think God is saying, oh, put on a happy face and just pretend that everything's okay. (sighs) Guys, joy is not a feeling that overcomes you. In fact, the reality is you might not feel joy in the moment, but you can find joy in the meaning that God is using even this hard, awful, difficult moment for his glory and, and ultimately for your good. As hardships happen, we need to know, he says, that this testing of our faith is is God's working. He is testing us, not to see if we have faith or not, but to purify our faith and to stretch our faith, to help us grow and to develop us. And in particular, he's trying to develop endurance in us. 
The word picture here is of a person under some type of load. It could be a manageable load that you've carried so long that it's starting to break you down, or it could be an intensely heavy load that you don't think that you can hold up under at all. And here he says that, that this heavy load, a person who is a Christian has said, I will stay under the load that God puts on my back. Instead of trying to escape, I, I, will, I, will, I will endure. And how different is that than what we typically do? We often try to live our lives trying to get out from under or fix our circumstances. And we get frustrated if God doesn't change it. I mean, I, the hard reality is there are times where your circumstances aren't going to change. Now, that doesn't sell. You want to build a crowd? You tell them, oh, trust God, it always gets better. Trust God and you'll win. Trust God and you hit, your numbers hit. That'll grow a crowd. But it's not the truth. Some of you are in situations that haven't changed for years. A health issue has left you less able than you were. A marital situation has created tension that has lasted for years. You close the casket on somebody that you've lived with for 50 years, that doesn't go away just because somebody says, oh, count it on joy. It's still there, and it is still heavy. But we believe that even in those heavy moments, the joy we have is not in the moment, not in the event, not in the circumstances, but that God can use this moment for his glory. And even this can make our king look good. And we let endurance have its full effect. Now, this is odd. I mean, let endurance have its full effect. May you be strong at getting strong. You know, that's kind of a, a weird way of saying something. Uh, we, we could say this way. We need to hold on while God has us in our trials. Uh, we need to, to hold on and be as strong as possible. Endurance isn't usually developed over time. Endurance is usually developed through agony. Uh, there's no doubt when we're carrying heavy loads, that we're going to be tempted to drop the weight. But we have to decide, am I going to trust in the character of God? You know, the character that I see demonstrated in the cross and the resurrection. Am I going to trust in God's character? Or am I going to let the difficulty of the moment push me away from God? See, that's where some of you have been. You know, you've let the difficulty, of the moment. this might be your first time back to church in a long time because you let the difficulty of the moment keep you away. The Bible says if we endure, if we hold on, if we hold up, we believe God is up to something and we hold on until we understand if we hold on, we will be mature and complete and lack nothing. Now, translations are all over the map on these three words, mature, complete, and like nothing. And they can be confusing. Your Bible might say perfect. Some people have confused this and say, well, the Bible says that we can be perfect and we won't sin anymore. Well, the Bible also says if you say that you don't have sin, you're a liar and the truth's not in you. So perfection is not what this is teaching. We're still going to stumble and we're still going to fall. So what does he mean to be mature or perfect? Uh, some people get confused over the phrase like nothing. Oh my goodness, prosperity gospel people, you'll never like, you won't like health, you won't like happiness, you won't like money, you won't like hogwash. You know, that, it's just lifting a verse out of context. There are, Jesus said, those who want to live a godly life, or excuse me, Paul said, those who want to live a godly life will suffer. Jesus said, in this world, you're going to have trials and tribulations. It's a part of this life. What does he mean, like nothing? You won't lack the ability to reflect Jesus. In your hard moment, God is at work. He is using you for his glory. You hold on until he, he shows himself through you. And if you hold on, he will show up. He will show himself to be, to be 
the great God who can give you the strength even in the moment. This text is about becoming a mature believer, not about growing your pocketbook. It's about being conformed to the image of the Son, where people look at you and see Jesus. And if you hold on, you reflect Jesus as God has designed your life. And if you say, he is God and I'm his slave, I'm his servant, does it really matter what you like or not? Or does it matter what he's called you to do? In fact, holding on in hardships is probably your best opportunity to reflect the love of God. One time, when I was at my former church in Hopkinsville, Edgewood Baptist, it's been about 20 years ago now. We were having vacation Bible school. And we were, hadn't relocated yet. And we were still in our neighborhood uh, uh, context. And there was a family that lived behind us that had about eight kids. And so our Bible school was having record numbers that year. You know, and they had a 16-year-old daughter who was off. And, I mean, she attractive girl, but you could tell there was mentally something not quite right because she would say stuff that would be harsh and, and rude but she wanted to help at Bible school. And we thought, well, she probably better for her to be around Christian people than not. So we, we put her with rec time. Well, at rec time, she started like yelling and screaming at the kids. Like yelling and screaming at the kids. All out onslaught. And they came and got me. It was so bad. So I went and found her. And I, I said, hey, let's go talk. And so we went and talked. And we were standing outside, outside a couple glass doors there out on the uh, stoop of the church. And I said, hey, I'm going to move you from rec into uh, 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 the best part of Bible school, refreshments. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to move you into the refreshments. She did not like that. Oh, she got angry. And she started cussing me. I mean, as aggressive as anybody in my life has ever come at me. I mean, she had made a sailor blush. It was bad. And I'm just standing there and just kind of in shock, but I don't say anything. And I tell her, hey, with this attitude, we want you to come back and you can try again tomorrow, but you're going to have to go home today. So I sent her home. and She cussed me all the way home. And after she left, a lady who became one of our ministry assistants later on stepped outside and she looked at me and she said, Pastor, I've never seen Jesus in you more than when you just took it. And all I could think is, well, I couldn't think anything to say. <laughs> you know, I wish it had been a real holy moment. Uh, but, but I think you get the point, right? It's in adversity when Christ shows through us the most. It's in moments of hardship that character is revealed. Recently, I heard the, had the privilege of hearing the testimony of Raina Simpson. Um, some of you knew her. She's a 37-year-old mother who faced multiple bouts with cancer. She and her family rode the roller coaster of diagnosis and treatment and possible healing and remission to an even more aggressive return of disease and then repeat and throughout her journey she gets this conflicting news, and yet the entire time she consistently pointed people to Jesus. She started ministries to help others going through chemo, and all the while through her honesty and kindness and faith, Jesus was showing up through her. Listen, every part of those who know her wish she was still here, but I can promise you she will never reflect the beauty of Jesus more than she did through her adversity. That's just the way it works. We have an opportunity to show Jesus to the world. And truthfully, there are things that are hard in life that we have a hard time understanding. How in the world could God use this? Early death, war, loss of a child, pat answers from a preacher or a friend. They, they fall short in those times. But this is where James is so helpful. He says... This third command, you, you believe God's at work, you hold on until you see it, and if you can't see it, you ask God for wisdom. God, help me see it. Help me know. Ask God to show you how can I glorify you even in this unthinkable moment. We're going to have questions. We're going to be confused. We will all have a hard time making sense of a stock market crashing weeks before you plan retirement. Or health failing when you're caring for your aging parent. We often don't understand. But please know this. God is not going to come down on you because you don't understand. 
He invites you to ask of him. He, he, he asks you to say, God, what, what, what do I need to know? How can this be used? If you ask him, God, how can I reflect you in this moment? He'll give it to you. He will show you. If you like this wisdom, he'll provide it. A few years ago, while I was at Edgewood, we were taking a mission trip to Brazil. Three days before the trip, we sent $9,000 ahead via Western Union. I'd been a few times. I knew I could trust the guy that I was sending the money to. Money for food and hotels and travel and supplies while in country. The day of the trip arrived. We're getting on the van to go to the airport in Nashville, and I get a phone call from a frantic friend in Brazil saying, friend, I've not received your money. I've not received your money. Well, I became a frantic pastor thinking, oh my goodness, where's the money? And I didn't know what to do, and the chairman of the deacons came out to the van and said, go to the bank on your way, get money. They wrote us a check. We cashed it out for money. Take it with you, and we'll figure it out when you get back. On the flight, I was asking God, why? Why'd you allow this to happen? I don't understand. And when we got there, the man who uh, was our interpreter and kind of guide always met us when we would just come through customs, and he would always meet us right there, and, and he, he was like smiling from ear to ear, and he said, good news, good news, the money has arrived. In the three days from the time that we sent the wire via Western Union and the time that he received notice that it was there, the dollar had almost doubled against the Brazilian Hayai. So we were able to buy twice the amount of supplies and bless that church in twice the fashion. And I love stories like that, don't you? When you don't know what's going on and then you pray and then God shows up and it works out exactly the way that you want. I love those stories. But it's not always the we won the game type of answer. It may be this Hardship was designed to break your pride or to rid you of selfishness or to let you show how faith holds up in the unimaginable. But God will answer and he'll show you why. He doesn't withhold what we need to know to glorify him as God, but there is a caveat. You can't ask God, what are you up to, and doubt. Now, James is not talking about doubting, is this real, is this not real? He's talking about doubting that God can't use this, and God doesn't love me if this is going on in my life, or God is not good. The person who has this type of doubt, they, they, they shouldn't expect to receive anything from the Lord. Uh, in fact, they are like a surging sea, driven and tossed by the wind. They're double-minded, he says. They, they, they have these two things going on. They want to live in the world and they just want comfort and yet they say they want to follow God and whatever, whenever. They're double-minded and they're unstable in all their ways. The New Testament doesn't teach that everyone will have the same things in this life and this is hard. I had a young person come talk to me after the service. They're going through one of those unimaginables. I sure wish I could stand up here and say, it'll go away for sure. I don't know if it will. I don't know why some of us seem to live easier lives than others and have more than others, and some live difficult lives and face tragedy after tragedy. I don't understand that completely, but I am confident that we do have different lives that God has called us to to reflect his glory. Some of us, will be the brother in humble circumstances. We might be poor. We, we might be of poor health. We might face substantial loss. And he says in those moments, we should boast or talk about the fact that God is enough, that he's watching over me. That, that, that he is near the brokenhearted and he comforts the hurting and he lifts up the downcast. And, and until that time that he lifts us up, we should remind ourselves that the current testing is God's way of growing and developing me so that I can reflect Jesus more. Because he's my Lord and I'm his slave. But if we have a lot, which honestly is probably most of us in this room, there's hard work that has to be done there. He says in verse 10, but let the rich boast in his humiliation. Yeah. I typically don't boast when I'm humiliated. 
typically get ticked off. But here, James is saying, if you have a lot, instead of going around all the time saying, hey, man, praise God, look how much I have. Praise God, look how much my life is easy. Instead of doing that, maybe you would be better off to, to celebrate those moments where you realize just how frail you are. Where you hit a bump in the road, or you don't get your way, or things don't work out exactly the way that you planned and on your timetable, or, or where you are deprived of an experience, or where you're seen as weak. This seems odd. But these moments remind us that no matter how much we have, when something doesn't go my way in this life, these moments remind me this life is not all there is. The flowers, we're like a flower in the field. This life just goes by so quick. And, and, and sun comes up and scorches, uh, wind scorches, and, and the dr grass dries up and the flower falls off and the beautiful appearance just fades away. Hey, guys, this is the way it is for all of us. I mean, you are in bondage to decay. I mean, and if you don't believe you're in bondage to decay, wait till you get my age and look in the mirror. You are. You are in bondage to decay. And, guys, 55 is not middle age. People who tell you that can't do math. <laughs> we, we are perishing we're falling apart. At the end, we will be weaker than we are in our prime. Guaranteed. And people who live for this life alone and invest everything in this life, they are fools. But there is more. There is an eternity. There is something beyond this life. You see, Christians believe that there is an existence Beyond this existence, we are but temporary in this lifetime, but there is an immortality that comes from being in Christ that when this life is over, our new life has just begun and nothing can take that away. And it never fails and it never fades and the hardships are gone. It's different. God has promised that in that life we will be rewarded. Not all God's favor, in fact, not even most of God's favor is found in this life. When a person endures trial, they, trials, they position themselves to receive this crown of life, which God has promised to those who love him. And this is not referring to a gold crown of authority, but to a garland wreath of victory. And this crown is God acknowledging and rewarding a faithful servant who's done well. And so I pray for us this morning that as we start this journey in James, it actually gets a little easier or different. But we would have this mindset that says, I'm in it as a servant of Jesus Christ. And I'm satisfied if he only rewards me with eternity. Let me share some things with you as we leave. Number one, Jesus has called us to bring glory to God. Number two, Life's circumstances aren't a determiner of God's love. God's goodness is not determined by our circumstances. I don't know how many times I'm going to have to say this, probably until the Lord Jesus takes me home because I'm still learning it. God loves me when my life stinks according to worldly standards. His love is not determined by how easy my circumstances are. His love is determined by the cross of Jesus Christ. And God often uses difficult circumstances to help us reflect Jesus to our world. Anybody can praise God when you score a touchdown or when you're on the beach on a two-week vacation. Anybody can say they're blessed as their bank account doubles, but it takes God in the life of, a, of an individual facing hardship to praise him. And God uses hardships to highlight the difference that he's made in us. You see, here's the reality. Everybody faces hardships. And if you want a life of praise and a life of joy, it can't be focused solely on that which is going on around you. You've got to have a different plane in your life where you can look up and you can see what God is doing vertically inside of you as well. And then number four, God will reward those who remain faithful. Count it all joys, my brothers and sisters, when you fall into various trials. You're a servant of God and God is using it. Let's pray.
Father, I thank you for the opportunity to preach your word this morning. I pray, Father God, that you have found me faithful. And God, I pray that your words will have their effect. You have told us, Lord, that your word will go forth and it will not return void. God, I pray that you would grow your people. And God, I ask, Lord, that you'd bring glory to yourself. Thank you, Lord, for the privilege of serving you in this way. Lord, I ask, God, that you would forgive me when um, I don't rejoice in all things. Uh, Lord, I ask that you would speak to your people at this time. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Guys, this sermon that I preached this morning was primarily for believers. It was. Uh, but I want you to understand that if you're trusting in this world instead of Christ, you're on a losing path. This world and all that is in it will pass away. And unless you've placed your faith and trust in Jesus and live in light of eternity, you're not going to have hope. We're going to sing a song in a minute, and then we're going to give some announcements. But we would love to talk to you today about how you can transfer your trust from yourself to Christ and how you can have a hope that endures. Uh, after the service, come and talk to me. One of our pastors will be up here. We'd be glad to talk to you this morning. Or perhaps you're here this morning and you are a believer, but these hardships are getting heavy and you just want somebody to pray for you. We'd be glad to pray for you at the end of the service today. What a perfect song we're going to sing. We hold up because we know Jesus has already won the battle. We're going to come back to one of the songs we sang earlier. Think about this in light of what we've studied today in James chapter 1. The battle's already won. 